<clears throat> pastor Steve Sogren was a pastor in Cincinnati and then also in, in California. And he shares an account I found from one of his books called Changing the World Through Kindness. It's a pretty disturbing account, actually. It's about his neighbors. Not long after we moved in, he said, I, I my wife Janine, noticed that there were some tensions between a couple of our neighbors. <laughs> one was a avid churchgoer, a vocal churchgoer, and the other was an unbeliever. And we just noticed that this was happening. And one day when they were working in their yards, uh, the neighbor, the, the unbeliever, came up to Steve as they were working and they began a conversation with the, with the phrase, Hey, Steve, aren't you a pastor? <laughs> and Steve yes, said, yeah. And he says, it seems implicit that the public's understanding that pastors exist to serve as referees in times of conflict. So I reluctantly listened to this troubled man's story about this neighbor whom he had never met or uh, didn't know very well, at least. And this neighbor was, was just wondering, why is this neighbor acting like this if he's supposed to be a Christian? And he unfolded a long history of numerous conflicts over small issues, but he says the last one has taken the cake. He said with a sigh, I received a letter from his attorney that if we do not trim our orange tree that borders his yard, he's going to sue us. And this man was didn't understand this. Why didn't he just come over and ask us to do it? Why did he go through his attorney and threaten to sue us for all of this? And then he said something that stuck with Steve. He says, I guess you Christians sometimes love us, but you don't like us very much. <laughs> you don't like us. The testimony of this Christian neighbor has been completely ruined by his contemptuous and unchristlike actions over the years. We don't know what the other issues were, but apparently there were many. But this last one was the icing on the cake. In fact, this man said, I was getting ready to trim the tree, but now there's no way I'm going to do anything until he forces me. I'll gladly go to court so I can have a story to tell about being sued by Christians over my orange tree. <laughs> that wasn't a very good witness to his neighbor, was it? But if we read about the Corinthians... <laughs> their testimony and their witness is 10 times worse than that neighbor's. I mean, the problems at the church in Corinth will make your head spin just reading about them. There's divisions in the church. One says, I belong to Paul. Another says, I belong to Peter. Another says, I belong to Apollos. And this is creating all kinds of jealousy and problems among them. He, he says, Sexual immorality of a kind not even found among the pagans is accepted in, in chapter 5, Paul talks about at the church in Corinth. A man is living with his father's wife, and they only boast about their tolerance towards him. Chapter 6 records other problems that they're having. There's church members that are suing one another, taking each other to court. Instead of dealing with it among themselves, they're taking it before unbelievers. And Paul sarcastically says, I guess I'm wondering if there's anybody wise enough and discerning enough among you to make a decision between one, uh, the, the conflicts that you're having. It goes on. Some people are getting drunk with with uh, their friends and others going hungry in their meals together and their potlucks, if you will, which is part of their whole communion celebration. So they were unworthily uh, observing the, the sacrament of communion. Their worship is disorderly and chaotic. Instead of building others up and taking considerations of others, everyone is just doing their own thing. And this is just a beginning list, probably, of all the problems that the church in Corinth is having. And Paul says, all of this, of course, is dishonoring to the name of Christ. And Paul says that he's writing this letter to address these issues and to address the questions that they have. But that's not where he begins. He doesn't begin by lighting into them with rebuke and correction. He, he'll deal directly and sternly with these problems, but he begins unexpectedly with thanksgiving for them. Now, how do you thank God for a church with that many problems? But that's where Paul begins, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 
verses 1 through 9. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere who call in the name of the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into the fellowship of his, with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. The word of the Lord. Notice Paul's address here to the church in Corinth first affirms who they are in Christ. He tells them and reminds them that they're sanctified in Jesus Christ. That is, they're set apart for his will and purposes. And he reminds them that they are among those everywhere in all the world and every place who confess that Jesus is Lord. And he reminds them that they're not only sanctified in Christ Jesus in terms of who they are in Christ, but they're also called to live a holy life, called to be God's holy people in the world. And for this, he can be thankful. Now, there's something implicit, of course, going on here, because it is almost as if Paul is holding up a mirror to the Corinthians, telling them who they are in Christ, and that will automatically show the discrepancy between the way they're acting and the way they're living and with their call. But that's not, that's not what Paul is doing just yet. He's not going there just yet, explicitly at least. Paul first tells them that he always thanks God for them. That's where he begins. He thanks God for this troubled church. <laughs> it's part of this threefold pattern of prayer that is in Paul's letters. Paul prays for the church, Paul gives instruction about prayer, and then Paul requests prayer from the church. And here he says, I'm always thanking God in prayer for you. But how can Paul thank God for a church with this many problems? <laughs> well, Paul, look at what he gives thanks for. Paul gives thanks to God for what God has done for them. He's not He's not saying, thank you, God, for all these problems that they've created. No, he's thanking God for what God has done. And he's thanking God for the grace given to them in Christ Jesus, not their failures. Later in chapter 1, verses 26 through 31, he fleshes it out this way. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things, the things that are not, to shame the things or to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him you are in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul is celebrating and thanking God for what God has done for them and in them. He goes on to say in those verses, Christ has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, our holiness and redemption. Therefore, it is as, as it is written, the one, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So Paul's celebrating what God has done in their lives, the grace given to them. He's celebrating all of that. And the Corinthian believers are among those, he's acknowledging among those everywhere and every place who call on the name of the Lord. They're among those believers, that church, Jesus' church, those who confess that Jesus is Lord. And that's what should unite them because that's what unites them, uh, believers everywhere. In fact, one of the the uh, translations of this scripture even titled it that way, a call to unity. It's, a, it's inviting them to realize who they are in Christ. And he even goes on to bring that out further. You know, all the divisions, I belong to this and that person. I belong to Peter, Paul, Apollos, whatever. And he asked this question, was Paul crucified for you? No, get it together, get it right, get your mindset right. Faith in Christ is your solidarity. Let that be what unites you. But he, he's only implying that so far because he's beginning with thanksgiving. 
Now, we probably don't understand the depths of depravity from which these Gentile believers were redeemed. We probably don't understand how they could live this way after being redeemed by the Lord and being, being uh, saved into a fellowship with his son. What we probably don't understand is what they came out of and from. A whole life dictated and dominated by idolatry all around. Uh, by sexual immorality of every kind. By paganism all around. So they, Pastor Wayne talked about it in, in this way in our men's Bible studies when we were going through a lot of these letters. Is What we don't understand is that these believers are kind of at ground zero. They have no working knowledge of who God is at all. They're from a completely different background and context. And so Paul, what he's celebrating is, you've been redeemed from all that mess and those empty things. You're now in Christ. That's what he's celebrating. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, he states it even more explicitly in that way. He says, he says, Or don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the habitually drunk, nor verbal abusers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. He's acknowledging the great redemptive work that God has done in them, the grace given to them. And he says, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in the spirit of our God, that's what Paul is giving thanks for. That's how Paul can thank God for a church with all the problems that they're having. He's celebrating what God has done for them. He also thanks God, notice, that they've been enriched in Christ in every way, in all speech and all knowledge. That is, in Christ they have been given access to all the spiritual blessings available to them, and every spiritual gift made available to them, and he celebrates that. Alan Johnson says, in light of the Corinthians' tendency toward pride in spiritual gifts, they're reminded that they were enriched in Christ this isn't something that they had on their own. This is something given to them as well. Paul acknowledges the legitimacy and value of these gifts, but only as they're grounded in Christ. And Paul will go on to say in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, for the good of the building up of the body of Christ. But he's only going to later deal with that abuse. That's the end of the quote there. Paul's prayer, first of all, is to thank God for what God has done in the lives of these believers. And he's saying all of this is confirmation of the testimony of Christ being affirmed in you. What can we give God thanks for in our lives and for this church? Paul's giving thanks for what God has done for them, and certainly we could give God thanks for some of the same, same things. We can give God thanks for the grace given to us and Christ Jesus, wonderful grace of Jesus, we sang. Wonderful grace. We can give God thanks for the grace given to us. We can share in that thanksgiving. We can give God thanks for the spiritual blessings he's made available to us in Christ. We can give God thanks that we are among those who are in every place, call on the name of the Lord and confess that Jesus is Lord. We can give God thanks for his love and mercy and grace shown to us to invite us into his family. We can give him thanks for all of that. To give God thanks for these and whatever else we might include, though, doesn't mean ignoring the problems or challenges that we may have in our lives or as a church. Paul certainly doesn't do that. But we do, we do need to thank God, don't we? <laughs> for what he's done and who he is. Here's what Thanksgiving does. Thanksgiving acknowledges God's presence and work in our lives in the church. Here's what Thanksgiving does. Thanksgiving guards our hearts from taking for granted God's blessings. Gratitude grows the more you give it as well. That's one of the lessons Chris Winfield learned about Thanksgiving and gratitude, that gratitude seems to grow the more that you give it, and he shares some of his journey. He says, I was always asking the question, why did this happen, have to happen to me? Why did this have to happen to me? He would always ask. And it didn't matter if it was something big, like his dog getting cancer or one of his friends who died. 
or if it was something small like a delay of a flight or even getting the stain on his shirt, he was always having this mindset, oh, poor me, why did this have to happen to me? He noticed that that, that that was his constant attitude, no matter what the circumstance was, if it was something little or big, oh, poor me. But he said, this all started to change once I began writing a gratitude list every single day for the past 34 plus months, and it's changed my life profoundly, he says. He said it wasn't easy. You might think it might be easy to, to do that, but his mentor asked him to send him by a message three blessings or three things that he was thankful for every day. He said, well, that sounded easy enough, but once he began to get into that, it became difficult. He said, why? Because I, never, I didn't live my life that way. I wasn't, I wasn't grateful for anything. It was all about me, all about poor little me. Even a stain on my shirt made it all about me. He said, but that began to work in my heart. The Lord was using that in his life to change him. Or that's how it can work in our lives if we know the Lord. Perhaps that's why Paul instructs another church, the Thessalonians, to rejoice always. Pray without ceasing and give God thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Thanksgiving is part of that renewing work that the Holy Spirit does in our lives. Diedrich Bonhoeffer states why it's important that we thank God for the church that we're part of. He's talking about in terms of his whole life, but, but Paul's talking about thanking God for the church. And what, why is it important to thank God for the church? He says, if we do not give God thanks daily for the Christian fellowship in which we've been placed, even when there's no great experience, no discoverable riches, but much weakness, small faith, and difficulty, and if, on the contrary, we only keep complaining to God that everything is so paltry and petty, so far from what we expected, then we actually hinder God from letting our fellowship grow according to the measure and riches which are there for us in Christ Jesus. At the end of the, the sermon, I'm going to give as part of the response an opportunity to either pray or even write out some things that you're grateful for, some blessings from God that you're thankful for. And you might even take that challenge upon yourself to, to thank the Lord for three things every day. What Paul's thankful for is that God has done this wonderful redemptive work among this, this church in Corinth. <laughs> that he is, he is, he's, he's redeemed them and he's thanking God for them. But the problem is, the problems still are there. <laughs> their lives are still out of sync with their calling to live as God's people. In fact, at the, uh, Alan Johnson, I meant to uh, share this earlier. When Paul addresses the Corinthians as sanctified in Christ Jesus, he introduced a, a tension that will play itself throughout the letter for the Corinthians' actual conduct seemed to be terribly out of sync with their vocation to be God's covenant people. How is it that he can give God thanks for them when they're, they're so out of sync with their calling to live as God's people? How is, that, how is Thanksgiving more than just a sugarcoating of the whole situation? How is Thanksgiving more than just, you know, positive thinking? How is that really going to change anything? And again, how can Paul really thank God for a church with this many problems? And another answer to the question is found in verses 8 through 9. Look at those verses. I'll read them again. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into the fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. Paul trusts God's continuing work in the lives of these believers to keep them firm in the faith until the end, till the day of Christ Jesus. The message puts verse 8 this way, God himself is right alongside of you to keep you steady and on track. In other words, Paul's confidence isn't in the Corinthians. Paul's confidence is in God's faithfulness. In God's work among these, these Corinthian believers. 
They're not going to be able to fix themselves through some kind of behavior modification program. He is confident that God's at work in them and will transform them from one degree of glory to another as he goes on to write in his second letter to the Corinthians. He's believing God will not just give up on them and say, oh, well, they've got too many problems. Paul's not doing that, and he's confident that God won't. God will be faithful to this church. God will not leave them where they're at as infants in Christ. They, they, they certainly aren't where they need to be, but God will not leave them there and will continue to work in them to bring them to where they do need to be. And by the day of Christ Jesus, that's what Paul is confident in. That's why he can thank God for this church now they have to respond and repent and cooperate with God's transforming work. But Paul is confident that the Lord will be faithful to work in them. Those verses from 2, Thessalonians, or 2 Corinthians 3 that I mentioned state it this way, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom, and we all with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory. We're being transformed into His image, from one degree of glory to another, or with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Right now, their lives are obviously not in sync with their calling to be God's people. I don't have to rehearse that whole list of problems I listed earlier. If you just read the letter, it's all there. They're obviously out of sync with who they are in Christ, and they're calling to be God's holy people. But Paul is believing and trusting that God will be faithful to continue to work in them. Their current spirit, spiritual condition isn't where they need to be, but it isn't where they're going to remain either. God is faithful. I had this placard that I don't remember where I got it. I think someone might have gotten it for me or I, I bought it somewhere, but I have it hanging around the sanctuary all the time. And I sometimes put it on the altar and I saw it there this morning. This is the statement Paul makes, and this is why he's so confident. This is why he can thank God for the Corinthians, even though they're in a big mess, even though there's so many problems, he's thanking God because his confidence is in God's faithfulness. God is faithful. Some of the other translations help us flesh out what that means, what God's faithfulness means. God is faithful. It means that God is worthy of our trust and can be relied on. Here's what the New Living Translation, how it translates it. He is faithful to do what he says. And what does Paul say God will do? Look at verse 8 again. He will keep you strong to the end. Paul is believing that for the Corinthians. Not because, they, not because of them but because of God's work in their hearts and lives. The Living Bible puts it, He always does just as He says. The message puts it, He'll never give up on you, never forget that. The J.B. Phillips, and this is where I got the title of the sermon, God is utterly dependable. That's what His faithfulness means. God is utterly dependable dependable. God is faithful. This is to whom we pray. We're praying to a faithful God who keeps his promises. We're praying to a trustworthy God who we can trust. That's to whom we pray. And because of his faithfulness, we always have a reason to give him thanks. If we can't find any other reason to give God thanks, we can always thank him for his faithfulness. My my parents gave me another reminder of this even yesterday. And they texted me, and I think Beth was included, my beautiful wife Beth was included in the text, but they said, your Uncle Mark and Aunt Roxanne are here, and we are praying for you. And they sent me the promise of Hebrews 13, 6. He will never leave you or forsake you. God is faithful. We sang those songs, but I hope you took it to heart this morning. God is faithful. Great is His faithfulness. In fact, in my devotional time this morning, I just read through that hymn and just looked at all the reasons that that could be stated. Did you hear them? I'll just go through them a little bit this morning. Did you see them? Great is Thy faithfulness. There's no shadow of turning with Thee. He's absolutely consistent in who He is. <laughs> 
You don't change your compassions. They never fail. Great is your faithfulness, is quoting Lamentations. Your mercies are new every morning. We can give God thanks that he's faithful every morning. There's new, fresh mercy for us. We can give him thanks for that. As thou hast be, forever will be. We can give him thanks for his faithfulness. And it goes through the entire song. It's talking about reasons. We can know that God is faithful. He's utterly dependable. He's trustworthy and reliable. Even, even in the most difficult of circumstances. Evelyn Husband lost the love of her life. The space shuttle commander Rick's Rick husband in a national tragedy in August of 2003. A year later, she shared her message about God's faithfulness and healing hand. On that day of the day of the tragedy in August of 2003, she was with all the other families of the Space Shuttle Columbia, their crew, the landing site near the landing site at Cape Carnaval, Florida, waiting for her husband to return home as the other families waited for their loved ones. And the shuttle was just minutes from landing, but NASA's mission control lost contact with the shuttle crew. And in the next few moments, a tragedy occurred. There was images and video of the space shuttle blowing up and breaking apart in the Texas skyline. NASA officials scrambled to get the family members out of the view of television cameras. And in those moments, Evelyn remembers looking at her children, who were only 7 and 12 at the time, wondering what would happen now with the loss of her husband. But she said in those moments, she said that was the beginning of, of this powerful message that I'm now able to share, she says a year later. Even in the midst of, mo of the most intense suffering and pain, God is faithful. She said in those moments, this is, this is the thought of her heart, the prayer of her heart, deep inside, I knew God was going to walk with me through this somehow. Because I knew, I knew it, because he'd walk with me through other crises earlier in my life. God is faithful. I want to give you the opportunity now to write out a prayer of thanksgiving, or maybe you would just want to pray silently where you're at or find your place of prayer and just express that in prayer to him. Sometimes it helps us to write it out so that we actually take the opportunity and we don't pass it by and say, oh, I'll do that later. Would you take a few moments, and there's usually some paper in the front of the pew there and a pencil. You can write out some things that you're grateful for, some blessings. Perhaps it's God's faithfulness. Perhaps it's some of the things that we've already talked about this morning. We can certainly give God thanks for his grace given to us. We can certainly give God thanks for his faithfulness. Uh, we can certainly give God thanks for his spiritual blessings that he's given to us. And we can especially give him thanks for the suffering, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, which we're going to do here in a few moments through the sacrament of communion. But before we do that, and as kind of a preparation for that, would you spend these moments now in prayer, either writing some of these things down or just expressing them to the Lord in your heart? Would you spend some time giving God thanks? Thanks.